Donald Trump says he would end the war in 24 hours if he was elected president. It seems to me that the sole desire to bring the war to an end is beautiful. But this desire should be based on some real-life experience. Well, it looks as if Donald Trump had already these 24 hours once in his time. Oh, boy. Kane's all confused. That's uh, Zelensky giving an interview there. Uh, came out over the weekend, and he's saying, oh, no. The previous president's desire to end the war wasn't based on anything in real life, no real life experience. Although I really do feel like this could all be ended if the West was a little bit more you know, strict or stern or something. Welcome back to the program. Dana Lash here with you. Joining me now on this and a whole bunch of, it's just a grab bag of issues today. Stephen Yates at Yates on Twitter, senior fellow at America First Policy Institute and chair of the China Policy Initiative. I just got to get your reaction to that because we have, a, as I said, a whole grab bag of stuff for you today. Well, Dana, I mean, it's very concerning to me to have someone who's been held up as a hero to the whole world speaking blithely about a war just going on forever. I mean, this mm -hmm. is something that is not just unpopular among Americans. A large number of Americans see it as very dangerous. We have overextended and overspent in many different ways. Uh, and so it, you know, he really risks losing the support he thinks he has in the bag by continuing to talk this way. Uh, it also just kind of comically, uh, I guess he sort of knows that they were not reinvaded by Russia when Donald Trump was in office. <laughs> but I don't know whether he yeah. realized it that. kind of it kind of happened uh, after the election, yeah. if memory serves. I don't know. My memory is pretty man good. With the T-shirt, so he got to be speaking the truth. Yeah, I mean, I remember it happening like happening like right after you know that that January is when everything kind of first kicked off and. That was after, and it was very conveniently after Trump left office and they had the whole inauguration, and then that's when all these headlines started kicking into gear and all the moves started, you know, so I don't know when his 24 hours was was, going, was supposed to be. No, it wasn't written into the script that was being read from Ukraine, so here we are. <laughs> okay, I got to ask you about Janet Yellen's Hobbit bow. Uh, so <laughs> it was, I was trying, explain this for us, because this seems to me, and I understand, because I know we're going to have some naysayers out there who are going to say, but Dana, in Asian culture, it's like the equivalent of a handshake. But she bowed repeatedly, like one of those woodpeckers that gets the water or whatever that yard yep. ornament is. It was really wild to watch it. And, you know, she's, a, you know, diminutive in stature. So she goes up and she just repeatedly bows to this, this vice premier here of China. It just looked awkward. And I noticed... He didn't really bow in return to her. Uh, he's, it seemed hostile to her, and it also seemed like he didn't. He wanted to let go of her hand, and she wasn't going to allow it either. I don't. I don't know. Maybe she was going to fall forward from bowing. I, your take on this? Well, my head hurts with all the lunacy that I hear in response to these kinds of things, uh, because all the people that just want to say them racisms or whatever else, them racisms. Uh, because that's what people in Asia do. Uh, well, the Asian in that picture didn't do it. Uh, so <laughs> kind of a problem for their whole argument. He stood tall as a tree and gladly received this weirdo supplicant coming and doing what no one else is doing to him because he's not Xi Jinping. He's not the boss. In some ways, he's got to be scared. Hey, is someone going to see this person bowing at me? I don't want this attention. Uh, so there's, you know, this whole thing. No one in their right mind writes this into protocol. There's nothing in the communist system that says bow mm. uh, in the in these circumstances, and no American should be bowing to anyone except those that sacrifice to give us what we have today. That's it. Yeah. Anything besides that, and you're not an American to me. It's very hard. I mean, I just would think we're talking with our friend Stephen Yates at Yates Comes on Twitter. If I mean, because in some respects, it's kind of a negotiation. I mean, her showing up there. I mean, there she's. Everyone's trying to reinvent the meeting as, oh well, this is to normalize or to try to put relations on a better track. That's never going to happen. This is a kind of who's stronger. Let's have a negotiation. She immediately loses the plot, walking right in and just like I think she's walking in, bowing. It was weird. She bowed and shook hands. It's a position and said of weakness. Was going all great. It was. It, she was covering all the bases because it's all just settling everything down because she and President Biden 
don't look through this through the lens of strategic competition. Oh, and we're just happy that they look through lenses and see stuff differently, but it really doesn't matter if the Chinese leader sees things a different way. Mm. And uh, by, as far as I could tell, that leader didn't give her the time of day. So I don't, you know, we have the Biden administration sending the national security advisor, the secretary of state, the secretary of treasury, the climate czar allegedly is on the way. And then President Biden is ardently seeking a meeting with Xi Jinping. Uh, and so we have American after American knocking at the door, bowing to the emperor, kissing the ring. And the Chinese are like, OK, uh, mm. they're not changing anything. Yeah. So uh, I so I this this to me, it just projects weakness physically and substantive. Yeah, I, I it just it's a bad move for her to do. Speaking of China and I. I like Elon Musk, but I view him as chaos neutral. And, you know, he's got his gigafactory in Shanghai, and he's been to China recently where he was meeting with, you know, uh, the, his automaker counterparts there, people who run the factory, he was meeting with some of the, you know, I mean, I, I understand you got to do business. Some of the C I, don't, I don't use that for CCP, though. I don't, think, I don't think that that excuse applies. He signed on to this letter, apparently, pledging Tesla's commitment to China's core socialist values – to continue operations in the country. And apparently Chinese authorities were demanding that Tesla change their ways because the company were slashing their prices to try to, you know, edge out. I mean, it's what we would do in a free market. You know, you're edging out your competition. Well, Xi Jinping and leaders of the CCP were saying no. So they had they made him sign this like truce, so to speak. I wanted to kind of get your take on this. Well, first, uh, I, I would give Elon Musk some credit for grappling with tigers that others didn't have the strength or the time or the wealth to be able to do. Uh, and so if he has some master plan that he hasn't shared with me <laughs> about where he intends to go on the Chinese side, he's at least gotten a track record of pulling on the side of free expression and, and telling the truth. I, you know, It could be a tactical kind of decision. I don't like it. Uh, I would like to see those with real power in the world, in the in industry and in innovation, speak the truth to the Chinese people. Uh, and you know, if his message is, "Hey, your leaders are about to lead your economy into dangerous territory, but you can seek safe haven in companies like mine for an alternative future," that's one thing. I don't think that's what that letter is about. It's cut from the cloth of making people bow to the emperor. Mm. Uh, and so I don't like it. I think that's a bad look also. Uh, but, you know, I think Elon's a little bit different animal than a lot of our other business leaders that go over there and just have a, a, a big banquet and sing Kumbaya and pray to the sun god about the world climate. Yeah, I do agree on that. And, and now I said it was a grab bag today. Never thought I was going to be asking you about this. So Barbie, right? <laughs> the movie. Warner Brothers, I know, is defending what they are calling a childlike map in the Barbie film. And it's when uh, Margot Robbie's character is speaking and behind her is this, you know, map of the world. But it shows Beijing's claim to the South China Sea, to this territory. I mean, it's in line with how China apparently would represent its claims and there's a lot of criticism that is being thrown at Warner Brothers for this movie. The movie was banned in Vietnam. I know that a lot of films have to, if they want a Chinese opening, if they want all those theaters, they have to go past the censors and they have to do a number of things. I don't know. I To me, it seems like this might have been the case. But something as small as this, and people are trying to say that it's kind of a culture war thing, but it's not. This is a foreign policy thing. I mean... I mean, I, it looks like it, you know, it's an accurate, I just, it's wild because it's in the Barbie movie. Yeah. Well, Barbie, Dana Lash, and Steve Yates were things that have never been in a tweet until today. Yes, true. Uh, but uh, this is a, this is on the one hand funny. On the other hand, it's, this is not a joke. And it's just like the bowing thing where lunatics say, oh, but this is just what they do. And the Asian didn't do it. Well, Vietnam is not a part of our culture war right now. And they're the ones that banned this over this very issue. Uh, these movie producers, these big houses, they pay a lot of money to a lot of consultants, tend to be all Democrats, but they pay a lot of money to a lot of consultants to get things right 
make sure they're st they're not stepping on the wrong toes. Uh, but you know, if they'd have had an accidental map that showed the Confederacy, you think that would have been noticed? Uh, this is the Asian equivalent of making that kind of a ridiculous mistake. No one in Asia accepts this line. They all see it as a form of fascist aggression. They don't think it's friendly or an innocent mistake. Mm. And Top Gun showed that you can make a real movie with a real message and make real mega profits without being shown in a single Chinese theater. So they need to stop doing this. And the, and the line that, that Yates is talking about for those watching the simulcast, if one can throw the map up, for those listening, uh, the drawing, there's a little hyphenate. There's like, it looks like a bunch of dashes, this little line that comes on the right side of uh, where the, the, the mass that says Asia. And that's apparently the boundary that they drew up like back in the forties to designate that this is, you know, it's not disputed territory. This is China's claim. So that's what everyone's referring. I mean, it looks like it's innocuous enough because it's, you know, and, and I think the average person wouldn't be aware of this unless they were following oh. it to some extent. But it's still using a Hollywood film that, that to 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 further Chinese claims, the CCP claims. Yeah. Well, I would wager to say that more than half of all the world's trade goes through that area of water. Wow. Half. Uh, and this dashed line is used to claim essentially sovereign control over those seas. And it goes right up to the Philippines. It goes right up to Vietnam. It goes right up to Indonesia. And that's hundreds, if not thousands of miles from any legitimate Chinese territory. And so if you like oil, if you like natural gas, you like computer chips, if you like trading with countries like Japan and Taiwan and other parts of Asia, this affects your life. And people in Vietnam knew it right away. They didn't need some government censor to wake up and say, hey, we want to ban this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so really anybody with two bits of news and information or education could have advised this movie house to avoid it. Uh, I hope they get the Bud Light treatment for this. That would be fabulous. Yeah, that would be fabulous. Last question, talking with our friend Stephen Yates. Uh, Biden's traveling for NATO. Kind of shocking, and Germany agreed with us. They were saying that Ukraine is not ready for NATO membership, obviously angering Zelensky. Uh, and then meanwhile, Turkish President Erdogan was demanding that he yeah, demands EU membership because he let Sweden join the military alliance. But they were they they're denying Ukraine's entering to NATO. I'm I was actually kind of surprised to see that from this administration. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, you had to see that China and Russia were both against this, uh, and they seem to have a lot of pull, both of Ooh. them, with a lot of old Europe. Uh, and, you know, it's not just Macron of France that has famously suggested that Chinese aggression against America or our allies in Asia is not their fight, not their business. Uh, and so uh, I think going soft on this was borderline inevitable, although uh, I, have, I have some very good friends and people I respect that talk about the vaunted history of NATO. Its current existence is an embarrassment, if you ask me. Uh, and I think that they need to have some real soul searching about what a real alliance needs to be, what a real commitment to their own defenses really need to be. And if they don't do that, I don't know why anyone's trying to get in. Right. Yeah. I mean, wasn't this just to piggyback off that real quick? I mean, this was the same. These are the, all the same politicians and all of the the same advisors that were blasting Trump and said that, oh, well, NATO was shrink, which it didn't. NATO shrank under you know the Trump administration. It, it, it didn't. So now it, how do they explain this? It's like they're 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 completely contradictory and contradicting their positions yeah. on NATO. Well, consistency, truth, and all of that has nothing to do with the narrative. And so if you've got a narrative and an agenda, you just keep saying it, and the rest of us will just kind of put our hands over our eyes and pretend like, hey, we don't see facts as they are. We don't see any unending war grinding on here. We don't see a failure to rise to your own commitments to your own neighbors on defense spending among our European, air quotes, partners. Uh, and we, uh, you know, we'll just avert our eyes from the fact that China's moving pretty aggressively while all this is going on, and none of those European big powers are doing a lot about it. Uh, so, yep, I think that's the, the basically where they're going. This is what a Europe first world brings us, and I want to move past that. Past that, you would think in this woke time, the whitest of all alliances would be easy enough to move away from, but. They seem to be stuck in this rut of old 
colonial thinking. Mm, that's a good way to put it. Stephen Yates at Yates Comms, and you can also follow the America First Policy Institute at A1 Policy. Always good to see you. Thank you so much. Always good. Thank Have you, a good Anna. rest Thank of your you. week.